Hey everybody, I'm back because I got something worth filming, I guess. So, the low budget build guitar is out of the paint shop. At least the body and the neck are. And these are the results. This is four coats of the uh, Krylon. The Krylon is an acrylic paint, clear acrylic paint. Um, I was not obsessive compulsive about getting a mirror smooth finish. I like guitars with a bit of texture to them. And this has a little bit of grain and a little bit of run. And I tried to sand out the runs with some 400 fit first, but yeah. So it's, it's relatively, I mean, it's smooth, obviously, and it's relatively flat. And, uh, I hate to say it, man, but I never thought that pink would look this good, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's not all pink, obviously, and it's, and from a distance, it kind of has a purple thing going on, so, and the neck looks even more purple, but, yeah, so, anyway, that's it, that's what it looks like, and now I want to get it going like this so that I can then figure out the leg bar and then get that into the paint shop. So, yeah. Pink guitar, man. Wow. Guess next time I gotta leave a little more blue on. Yeah, I was thinking about this in general. Um, Using this technique, you should be able to take any two colors and the result that you get would be, if you take the two colors and blend them together, you're going to get like a light version and a dark version of whatever that blended shade is. So if you took, this is an example of red and blue makes purple depending on how light or how dark you're anywhere from pink to purple. Um, if you did like a, let's see, if you did like a, Kita would dye a yellow and a red makes orange. And so if you did this technique using yellow and red, so you put down the red first, sanded it back, and then hit it with yellow. Then, um, you'd end up with a, it would be a dark reddish orange for the dark part, and it would be almost yellow in the light parts and you could do it with like I was thinking brown and yellow might be an interesting combination because that way you would get some kind of an effect like this but in the two-tone vintage that you get on like old Gibsons where they're all some kind of brown or some kind of yellow color so but anyway um yeah, so there's the results of this stain method and the clear coating and the acrylic. And uh, and I didn't use the whole can of acrylic. I think there's just enough to do the bar. So, that'd be cool. Keep the costs down, right? When I do the, the grand accounting at the end of the build and get some final estimated costs for this entire thing, um... I'm going to price it out for both the acrylic and also if you'd use uh, brush on poly, which would have been cheaper. I didn't even think of that, so yeah. Otherwise, I would have been doing the brush on poly because it's cheaper. But I mean, it's not, it's not like it's kind of like doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to, to do like, oh, I'm going to do a low budget build. And, but then, uh, like, every step of the way, I make some excuse and then don't do it the low-budget way. Yeah, that's copping out in my book, so. 
with the lacquer. Um, it didn't even occur to me that, that, yeah, the poly would have been cheaper, actually. What it is is that I've been looking for the best combination of ease of application, um, cost, and fast drying time. And poly really sucks on the on the drying time and uh and rattle cans pretty much the easiest application you don't have to you don't have to mix stuff up and then put it in a gun you don't have to clean the gun when you're done you know you know when you're done with your applicator you just throw it away and uh and it's a self-contained applicator that's ready to go. You just take the cap off and start shooting, shake it up first. So yeah, that makes it easier to use than a gun. Granted, you can probably get better results with a high quality gun and the proper spring skills, but. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna shut up and get to work. Sorry about that. I have a tendency to ramble things, so. Okay. Got some neck screws and bar screws started. Gave them a squirt. Figured black looked better. Could do black, could do silver. Actually, I could do purple. Should I do purple hardware? Now we're trying to keep it low budge. Okay, so a dollar a can. There you go. One thing I found kind of interesting about this is that apparently, um, you like you hit it with the blue and then you sand it back, and the stuff that gets sanded back is actually the winter wood, the winter grain, the hard grain portion of the wood because the blue penetrates more deeply into the softer summer grain, summer wood. So what's weird about it is that the dark stuff, which is the winter wood, which is the harder stuff, when, when it's not stained, like, if you look over here at this quarter inch ply and it's a sheet of pine on top and it's got, got the light and dark grains. And the dark grains, which are the s narrower grains, that's the winter wood. But once you apply this method, the winter wood is the stuff that comes out pink and it's the summer wood that comes out purple. See, small grain, small grain, large grain, large grain. I thought that was kind of interesting and unexpected because what you essentially get is you get a grain reversal with this method where the what started out as dark grain ends up pink and what started out as light grain ends up purple. So. And it would do that for any two colors, I would think. Um, I'm not sure if applying the colors in different orders would make a difference. I suppose it would, because whatever you put on first, that's what's going to stay behind on your summer wood, your soft grain. So... But anyway, um, yeah, the other thing I wanted to do, since this is a low budget build and we're tracking the budget, just need to keep track of all the little stuff we use, just to be fair. Like I just used four screws and a bit of paint for the screws. And I'd use some Kita wood dye. And 
one can of acrylic. which was six dollars see now that I've done the now that I've done the number of coats know the number of coats this took I, I'm estimating that it'd be about like an ounce one fluid one fluid one fluid ounce about a shot worth of uh, poly to do a single coat and this was four coats so it'd be about four ounces of poly and I got a gallon can or I can go and look up online and see what like the smallest can of poly you can buy is. And you know, if they got like an eight ounce can of poly, then we'd say, well, well, you'd actually do two guitars. See, this is the problem is that, you know, say like, okay, the key to wood die, perfect example. Um, I used a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. The only way to get a little bit of red and a little bit of blue is to buy a five pack of five different colors, including red and blue. And there's enough dye in these five, in one pack, there's enough dye to probably do half a dozen guitars. So you end up with like enough dye to dye a couple dozen guitars. And you end up paying, you know, 20 bucks for it. So for one guitar, you're only using maybe a dollar's worth of dye. But in order to do this, if you didn't have any dye whatsoever, you'd have to go and shell out 20 bucks for dye. So do I instead go online and see the cheapest price I can find on like some blue writ dye and some red writ dye? you know, which might bring the overall cash overlay down. I don't know. Maybe I should do it both ways. Give an example price for if you're doing it in bulk and give it an example price for, for if you went out and, and bought the parts just for one build. What the, cause obviously if you're, if you're doing it in bulk, you know, if you're buying a gallon of poly and you're using it over a hundred builds, then you're only spending about 30 cents on each build for your clear coat. But if you're going to go out and just get a can of poly and use it to brush some clear coat on a guitar, then you might be shelling out, you know, $5 for a little can of poly or something like that. So I guess I'll price it out both ways. And that way, that way you, you can judge for yourself and it'll all be, you know, out in the open and fair. So, and I'm also trying to avoid, yeah, I built something out of like, you know, scrap wood for $30, but I used $10,000 worth of tools in the process. That's kind of cheating too, if you ask me, so. All right, so let me think. Um, what else has been used? I had a two by four. That's already on the list there. And I'm keeping a list of like all the parts and all the parts prices. So yeah, for the grand reckoning at the end. Let's see if we can pull this off. I'm pretty sure I can pull this off for under a hundred bucks. And we'll just see how low can you go. Um, originally, when I was adding stuff up, uh, it came up to or up around 60 bucks plus this kind of stuff. This is basically where we're at at the moment. All right, so let's see. Um, there was a 2x4, and it was cut and dyed and clear coated. And we got the dye and the clear coat on the list. And we got the 2x4 on the list, and there's a neck, and it's on the list, and it can stay and clear good. So everything's on the list at this point. We just use a little bit of paint, and we use our four screws. And that's everything. So, yeah, not too bad. Once again, this is something that I bought in bulk. I bought one of those entire big, huge tubs of screws, and I've... I bought it for, you know, just general use around here. And uh, 
and I had almost a full tub left over, and now I just use it for guitar builds. And they're, as you see, they're relatively long screws, so they're pretty good for, they're not three inch screws, they're like two and a half or two and a quarters or something, but yeah, they're long enough to be a neck screw, which means they're long enough for pretty much anything on a guitar. So, all right, um, yeah, once these screws dry, then I'll cut them to length, and I can get this neck on, and then I can figure out where the leg bar is going to go. And I found a leg bar blank when I was fishing through the wood pile. I don't see it at the moment, but I'll grab it out. And so that'll save some time there. All I need to do is figure out where it goes, how long it's going to be, and then cut it to length with uh, the coping saw, and then apply this process to it. So, let's see, hanging it over the heater, it's going to need two rounds of dyeing. You can do that in about 30 to 45 minutes, including drying time for both rounds. And then, perhaps, depending on if I want to finish more or less identical to this, then I'd have to go for coats of... Uh, acrylic, but maybe I could get away with fewer and get pretty decent results. <coughs> Might get away with like three and pretty much reproduce this look, so see how it goes. And for coats, um, I'm looking at like maybe 30 minutes drying time at most for a coat, if I'm putting it over near the heater. Not right over the heater, I don't want to bake and bubble any of them, but yeah. So drying times are really pretty short. I could probably uh, have the bar in and out of the paint shop and like... In and out of the paint shop and ready to sand and polish at least in like three hours. From bare wood to this in like three hours. Which is pretty darn impressive actually when it comes to high-speed finishes for guitars. Yeah, I'll take that any day of the week. If I can go from like bare wood to this kind of a thing in three hours, or sanded wood to this in three hours. Yeah, not too shabby, not too shabby. So, and, and I was actually a bit surprised because oftentimes the acrylic tends to be just a little bit more expensive than lacquer. And if you go to like a big box, you know, locally, you might discover that's true. I just happen to be stuck with only being able to get stuff online at the moment. So, but anyway, um, yeah, waiting for paint to dry. I'm going to shut up. You don't need to hear me ramble while we wait for paint. I'll be back. One thing I need to do since the body came out of the paint shop and it has a bunch of pre-drilled holes in it, all these holes need to be chased. So. Do the next screws from this side. That way if you get a tear out, it's on that side and it's under the neck where it doesn't show. And I'll use a reamer for these guys. The low budge way would be to just re-drill like I just did for the neck. Just occurred to me I still need to do some cleanup on the neck, but um, I think I'll go ahead and pop it on first. This is like when it first becomes a guitar. And so, yeah, I think I'll do that and then I can take the neck back off and like, you know, do the fret ends and roll the fretboard edges and 
and polish up the frets and stuff like that. Check to make sure it's flat. Adjust the truss rod. And get it all ready to go. As far as like, as far as that goes, I'll just take it back off. Cause see, I can put it on and then I can figure out the leg bar and get that drying. And then I can play with the neck while that's drying. So, be right back. Okay, these were cut to length with bolt loppers. Hmm. Yeah, that's another kind of non-trivial tool that would be required. Well, you can always, you can always get screws the correct length, right? This is just the way I do it. <coughs> I suppose, yeah, probably what I should do is write down the size of the screws. Let's call it one inch. I'm going to price them out later. So it's, it's going to have, all right, so for the four screws, two are roughly one inch long screws for the neck. Okay. Because these have been cut off, and because I didn't grind new points on them, which is more work, and also means you need a grinder, which increases your tool cost. You take another screw, or maybe one of these before you paint it so you don't mess up with the paint while you're doing it, and you pre-tap these. This is the one that has the truss rod cavity in there. Maybe I should put some wax on this. Might not be a bad idea. Okay, I think I'm through the truss rod cavity. It's not getting any harder to turn it, so... Yeah, let me grab some wax. Yeah, we don't want, really want it to be squeaky tight when you're torquing it in. Only like maybe the last twist or two when you're finally torquing them down. Then squeaky tight might not be a bad idea. Still making some squeaky sounds, for sure. Oh, that should be good enough to get things going. Get some of that wax down on that hole. I didn't wax this or oil this. This is just, I actually used Windex to clean it off because I was, uh, because A, Windex won't react with the, with the acrylic and it does react with, um, Windex contains alcohol and alcohol dissolves shellac, which means you can't use Windex on a shellac finished guitar. Which I suppose is a plus for acrylic, huh? Or lacquer. Anyway, um... Yeah, so this hasn't been waxed or anything. I should probably... If, I, if or when I wax and oil it, it'll look even shinier and smoother. But anyway, okay, these are tapped. Time for the moment of truth. these are dropped through pretty much. Oh, it's still tight. Oh, come on, you're going to make me go another one? All right, fine. One bit size larger. It's 
thing's still on high speed for buffing. Turn it back to low speed for drilling. Now we give a man some fighting room. There we go. That's more like it. Okay. So we should be able to do something like this. This is always a bit fidgety the first time getting these things to start. There it is. The trick is you want to make sure you've got the end of this thing in the hole before you go for it or else you'll mess up the finish. Even though it doesn't really matter because the finish isn't visible unless you take the neck off. But yeah, if you want to try to make sure you find the hole. It also avoids like cross threading things. Yep, empty truss rod cavity. That's it for the moment. They're actually short enough that you can do a a crush fit bevel kind of a thing, but that's good enough for the moment. This is a cool looking finish. Yet it's pink. This is really blowing my mind here. I never would have thought something that's got pink in it could look so cool. All right, so, um, right, now I gotta figure out leg bar and stuff. And that dot right there is the, that's the saddle line. Okay, yeah, let me sit down and put this, sit down and hold this thing on my, in the seated playing position and see what's up. Okay, it looks like the bar should come out. Where's the dot there? There's the saddle on, which is back here. And it looks like the bar should start coming out from the body about where it's, the body changes from going straight to start to to slope down towards the center. So right about here is where the leg bar should come out. So that would put it back here somewhere. It needs the bottom edge of the bar will be right here and it'll be at a 25 degree angle. And looks like there's going to be plenty of territory to screw everything down. So that doesn't look to be a major issue. Uh, let me fish up the bar blank. I'll be back. So here's the bar blank. It's uh looks to be about a two foot section and it's um maybe fifteen mil square, something like that. Nineteen by seventeen. So it's almost three quarter inch square. Anyway, 
Um, yeah. Now I gotta figure out how long the bar needs to be, which means I gotta sit down with the guitar again. Be right back. Well, that's it, right about there. And there, there, whatever that is. Get a ruler. Typically they're like right around 18 inches. This looks like it might be a little longer. That's 19 and a half. And that's putting it at approximately 25, 30 degrees. And if the pivot screw goes in the center of the body, which allows you to get the two screws further away from each other, which makes the whole thing more stable. It puts less, less load on the wood here because you don't have them right next to each other, which tends to do that torque and twist thing and make it split. So you want to keep the screws, the further apart the screws are, the more stable the thing's going to be as far as like the load that you're putting on all your pieces. So, so next step is cut this thing to length and then uh, send it off to the paint shop. And then, while well, it's in the paint shop, then I can get the neck ready to go. Okay, I uh, decided I'm gonna cut off the other end of this because of this knot right here. If I cut it off from this end, that put that knot down, it would either be like around where the pivot screws and thumb screws would be, or at the other end it would be kind of close to where the strap button screw would be. So I figured it was better to have the knot in the middle of the bar than at one of the ends where I'm going to have screws. So the knot stays in the middle of the bar, and this end gets cut. Wherever that cut line is, there it is right there. You know, I was thinking about it, and if you end up having to chase all the holes after finishing, after the paint shop, then maybe just punch the holes, but don't drill them, and then send it through the paint shop, and then drill it once it gets out. And that way you don't have to drill it twice, basically. Or maybe don't even worry about punching it, just cut it out, finish it, and then drill it once it comes out of the paint shop. Mm -hmm. Well, if you drill before paint, but you're having to chase it anyway, so you're still taking a risk of tear out, so. Maybe just cut it, sand it, and then send it to the paint shop and then drill it when it comes out.
I think you get the idea. All sanded. Nice and smooth. Only took maybe 10, 15 minutes by hand. Time for dye. The other side of the yellow wood gives it a kind of greenish hue. That'll probably do it. Get all these little chunky things off it. It'll be easier to brush off after it has a minute or two to dry a little. But I can start at least. As it dries, this basically is just dust that you can brush off. It's because I'm using a tissue and it doesn't stand up quite as well as like a paper towel or a foam brush or whatever. Gotta make sure I get the ends here. There we go. Yeah, it looks like that end's already got. Okay, I don't want to do it. Ooh, I didn't put any holes in it. I got no way to hang it up. I'll just lean it up. Almost forgot. Still need a thumb screw.
all sanded, 